y'all, it's Chimney. Let me know, are we appreciating the red lip? Are we appreciating the head wrap? I feel like every person who starts a spiritual journey should be gifted with their first head wrap and the collection just grows over time <laughs> as they ascend to different levels of their spiritual enlightenment. Also, someone left me a comment that was like, you look like you would really like the music of India Ivory. <laughs> and I was just like, thank you. I am not my hair, I guess. In this video, we are gonna be talking about toxic positivity. Not the good stuff, but the taste of your lips, I'm on a ride. Dun, dun, dun. This is actually a video that was requested, and I was requested a while ago, and I did not quite know how to talk about it. I didn't quite have an angle on it. I don't think of myself as someone who is toxically positive. I think my energy is a genuine good energy, but I know I used to be the kind of person that was very much like a good vibes only, and I know currently I am very much about like very positive, joyful, loving, beautiful energy. And I know there's some folks who can find that to be toxically positive. So I listen to this podcast, well I listen to some of this podcast called The Dick Effect is the name of the podcast and an episode about toxic positivity. The way the show addressed the issue, I was like, oh, there are some areas here that I think I could add to if I were to join the conversation. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video is how I went from being someone who was toxically positive to hopefully, as you all would agree, genuinely very positive. Before we get into it, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Let me know in the comments how many head wraps do you have. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's like the, the chakra system, how there's like a different color. I think there should be a different head wrap for each level, you know, of like where you are spiritually and black is like the beginner level. Let me know if you are a toxic person, you know? Do you know yourself enough to know that you are in fact toxic or do you think you're great? I always wonder that because I know some folks who arguably could be considered negative and I'm always like, do they know that they're negative or are they just like, this is me? <laughs> Love me or leave me with my negative ass. All right, let's go ahead and get this video started. So I think some nice grounding for this conversation comes from Tich Nhat Han. This is How to See. I actually found this book. Someone just left this book back in LA in my old apartment. We had like a shared patio space. I walked out there and I just saw somebody had left this book as they were moving out. And this book has genuinely helped me out in so many ways. And it's reaffirmed one of my beliefs, which is that God is truly constantly giving me gifts. So I'm going to read one of the short stories from this book. It's truly just this little page and a half. All right, so settle in. I'm going to read you this story called Good or Bad Luck. One day, a farmer went to the field and found that his horse had run away. The people in the village said, oh, what bad luck. The next day, the horse returned with two other horses and the village people said, what good fortune. Then the farmer's son was thrown from one of the horses and broke his leg. The villagers expressed their sympathy. How unfortunate. Soon after, a war broke out and young men from the village were being drafted. But because the farmer's son had a broken leg, he was the only one not drafted. Now the village people told the farmer that his son's broken leg was really good luck. It is not possible to judge any event as simply fortunate or unfortunate, good or bad, as this age-old story shows. You must travel throughout all of time and space to know the true impact of any event. Every success contains some difficulties and every failure contributes to increased wisdom or future success. Every event is both fortunate and unfortunate. Fortunate and unfortunate, good and bad, these concepts exist only in our perceptions. So let's talk a little bit about this definition of toxic positivity. It's generally assumed to be when we're just like good vibes only, no negativity, no pain, no suffering, it's all good, take that negative bullshit away from here, we're not interested in it, etc. And as I was listening to the podcast, I think one thing they missed, if I want to offer a little bit of criticism, there really wasn't that tone, in my opinion, of compassion, because one of my core beliefs is that truly we are love and all we want to do is give love and receive love. That's it. And if we look at anyone, we can always find a direct relationship to what they were told when they were growing up and even in this current situation they're in now, what they're being told they have to do say or act like in order to give and receive love. So when I think about this idea of toxic positivity, the first thing I think about is what was going on in someone's life that this is the way that they had to show up in order to give or receive love. And so I can talk from my perspective because I think only within the last year or so that I start having greater capacity for more of the darkness in life in a true way, not in a superficial way, but to genuinely be able to sit with some of the pain and suffering of real life. And I think if you look at my childhood, you can see where that comes from. So I am 
one of six. My parents are Nigerian immigrants. My dad fought in the Biafra War. The Biafra War is not something that's taught in like American curriculum. I literally didn't know about it until recently when I was like, let me just look on Wikipedia and see what happened there. Because of course it also was not something that was like talked about growing up from a space of like, this is really what happened. This is some of the socio-political conditions that led up to it. Here's some of the suffering that was caused. Here's how different countries played a role in perpetuating it and the sides different countries took. Here's how it was related to Islam and Christianity, all these different things, right? That was not explained to me and arguably still has not been explained to me. But literally in reading the Wikipedia article, I was seeing terms that I've only seen used in like Nazi Germany. So I was seeing terms around like pogroms where you just go and like massacre people like and that was happening to the ethnic group that I belong to which is the Igbo people right. You know there's a lot going on right that my parents had to deal with before even coming to America and then of course as immigrants they faced all this racism all these cultural barriers you know just the reality of trying to build a new life for yourself in a country that's not your own. And then on top of that to then have six children that's so many children that's so many mouths to feed. I'm living with my sister right now the amount of food we go through is just to adopt. So we don't have a single child to our name and we are running through this food. So I can only imagine what it would be like to feed not only you and your partner but then six children that is a lot so as a child what i understood to be the way of getting that love that i needed was to actually require as little as possible to actually minimize my emotional needs because i recognized my parents didn't really have the capacity to give me to feed me in all the different emotional ways i needed to be fed one of the most powerful things that i have learned from good old time is evil is that our defense mechanisms our coping mechanisms are intelligent they are the things that we did as children that allowed us to survive okay they are beautiful things that helped us to get up to this point all right when they're no longer serving us we want to get mad at them we want to get mad at ourselves that we have these you know these habits and these instincts that we don't think are helping us out but when we were young when we needed them they helped us out all right so give yourself grace and give yourself a break if you're showing up in ways maybe in ways that include being toxically positive because that is what you needed to get to this point and you survived because of it all right dun, 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 dun. And I love what you do. Don't you know that you're toxic? And when I think about toxic positivity, I think some people don't like it because it's a form of spiritual bypassing. This is a word I learned after being in the spiritual community for a little bit. And what I think is very interesting about the term spiritual bypassing, one, I love it because it's as if we're like on this highway and then we see that like the route is heading towards pain and suffering and we're just like, mm -mm 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 -mm, get me off of the next exit. I'm going to bypass that. We all know if you're in the spiritual journey, we all know you can't bypass bypass like you can't escape any of this <laughs> you have to just keep going and the only direction is towards healing there's no you can't bypass it so it's to me it's a made-up term because I'm like you literally can't bypass anything but also I feel like it's a, a way low-key of like passing judgment this is also how I receive it right because of my trauma when I hear that term I hear it as a way of passing judgment because you're saying there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do spirituality and if you don't do it like how I say you should do it you're doing it wrong and you're doing spiritual bypassing and I'm just like I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Because to me the spiritual journey is this infinitely complex and beautiful thing and there's so many levels to it and it's just so interesting. My understanding currently is that there is one reason that we are on this spiritual journey and there's a reason why we want to become more conscious and that's because we want more of life to be able to live in us in this moment and when we are unconscious that is when we can find ourselves hurting ourselves and other people and not even realize that we're doing it. I was actually just talking to a friend of mine we're talking about conscious dating and how she can't even talk to people anymore who don't have that emotional awareness and all that. I'm kind of similar, you know, though I think I'm still figuring it out as we all are. But I think the reason for me, besides the fact that, you know, this spiritual journey is a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm gonna need you to be doing this work because I'm not gonna be the only one doing all this healing and you not healing. But really it's because when you aren't conscious, you might not even realize you're doing and saying things that are hurting yourself and hurting me and hurting the relationship. You're not doing it on purpose. It's just because you don't know what you're doing. In his book, healing collective trauma he talks about something that I truly always was a little bit confused by and it sheds so much light on me and that is the way that certain folks really celebrate and revere beating their children they like think it's like almost like a joke they kind of brag about it and they tell different stories about it and it's this thing that's part of especially like the black community and it's this thing that's almost like celebrated when it truly is physical violence on children so that's like weird and then in reading this book I realized like all things it comes back to slavery during slavery
slave times. And I say that as if people are not currently in this moment in slavery. I just want to note that, that globally there's actually more slavery now than there was in the time that I'm referring to, which is wild. Not going to get into that right now. But back in those slave times, enslaved folks knew that if their children were to be caught doing anything, you know, perceived as bad, even the smallest thing, the punishment and the violent harm that would come to them from the slave owners would be so, so terrible. So it was the parents, right, who were actually the ones to then discipline their children very harshly over very small infractions because they knew how much worse it would be if the slave owners were the one who found the child, right? Then that got passed down. Because of course that wasn't explained to the children, like this is why we're doing it. And if anything, it was said like, we're doing this because we love you, which is a very confusing thing to hear, <laughs> you know, as a child. But then it just got passed down. It just became a habit that is now just unconsciously being replicated. And I know that I went to like school for public policy and used to think that I'd be involved in like early child education and that kind of stuff too. Maybe I will be one day. The research shows that like beating children, believe it or not, physically hurting your children does not really lead to good outcomes, you know? I know it's crazy. But despite that, I know people who are literally my age who will reference the fact that they are going to beat their children and there's not a question about it. And it's fascinating to me because it just shows the way that people just do not examine some of these ideas and that is how they get passed down and unconsciously repeated until of course we bring healing to them. That book also gave another example which I thought was wild because my parents are very loving and very affirming to me which I think is a huge part of why I am the way I am. My parents were the first ones to be like girl you the best and I was like am I? And my mom was like you sure are and I was like okay. Thomas explained in the book how enslaved mothers knew that if their children were especially bright or beautiful or smart or athletic or whatever else they would be more likely to be sold into slavery and away from the mother. So when a slave owner would come and you know like be hanging and inspecting the child the mother was more likely to say oh you don't want him or her they're not that bright they're lazy like saying all these things to denigrate them because that was a short-term way of keeping the child close but of course like all things right it wasn't made clear and so it just became this thing that was unconsciously passed down and so now certain parents will still continue to denigrate their children and to make light of their accomplishments and not understanding the roots of this behavior that goes back literally generations right this is why we heal <laughs> so we just don't do things unconsciously hurting ourselves and others and not even knowing why. Taste of a poison paradise. So my journey of going from being toxically positive to genuinely positive came with healing. When I was going through it, I had all of this unprocessed trauma and grief and pain and sadness. And so the lid was just like, like the pot was full. All right, there wasn't anything more you could really add. It was a healthy, intelligent thing that I was doing to be toxically positive because it kept me from being overwhelmed by how much genuine negativity. And then as I started my healing journey, which I'm now calling a presencing journey I was able to actually feel more of these things right and as you feel the thing you feel the pain you cry it out then you can let it go and so now I can hold more of the truth of this moment and the realities of this moment and not let it overwhelm me and I think it's important to note that there is a difference between pain and suffering and if you're kinky you already know what I'm talking about we know pain pleasure hot cold rain sunshine warm soft all these things are just passing states and my understanding is that a lot of suffering comes from not being able to accept the present moment as it is happening. Not to say accept like you like what's happening, but accept where you're able to say, oh, this is what happened. So in my case, it would be amazing if my dad hadn't had to fight in that terrible war, if that war hadn't happened at all, if my mom hadn't gone through her trauma, if they hadn't experienced the racism in America, if all these things hadn't happened, which would have given them the capacity to just pour even more love on me and just provide for all of my emotional and social development needs. That would be so dope. That's not what happened. And so instead of being lost in wishing my past was different, I can now be in this present moment. I can learn to self-soothe and very importantly, I can forgive myself for thinking that they should be different than how they are. I'm reading Loving What Is by Byron Katie. It is genuinely such a transformative book. It's showing me in real time how you can look at these thoughts that cause you suffering because that's where all of our suffering really comes from and let them go if they're not serving you. I think that's kind of where Mickey Singer, from what I'm getting from Untethered Soul, you know, he does a lot of like, hey, let that stuff go, but he doesn't quite say how. What Byron Katie does to show you this step-by-step -step process of inquiry of like how you can actually let this stuff that's like causing you so much suffering which is not the thing itself but the thought about the thing how you can let that go intoxicating now with your loving now i think i'm ready now da -da -da -da. <laughs>
And bringing it back to toxic positivity, one of the things that podcast talks about is the reason why you shouldn't say everything is going to get better when one door closes, another window opens, all these platitudes. They were saying you shouldn't say that because one, there are genuinely bad things in the world, war, famine, disease, people who live in refugee camps. And when you say things like that, it is discounting all the pain and suffering the person is going through. And I think what's very interesting about that way of thinking is that it makes the suffering fully external. It says my suffering is one caused by external events that are happening and my suffering can be increased by what people say to me about my suffering. And I think what I'm learning from my own spiritual journey and some of these amazing books is that you are the cause and you are the cure. And if you look at these things like this short story by Tishnat Han, like I can imagine being the villager and saying with complete certainty, it is a bad thing. It is a bad thing that your son broke his leg. I wouldn't be able to imagine how that couldn't be a terrible, terrible thing. And then a war comes, and then my son goes off to work because he's healthy, and your son stays, and suddenly I can imagine how that could be a good thing. With the taste of your lips, I'm on a ride. You're toxic, I'm slipping under. I hope you like this video, y'all. Give me a thumbs up if you did. Subscribe to see more. Let me know in the comments if you feeling the vibe, all right? And I think I forgot, because having the shaped head is such a vibe, I forgot that I could also be doing accessories. And I just thought it'd be good to just treat y'all to what my face looks like with truly just the barest, barest tints of makeup. Can you imagine if I did a full face? Old videos of Chimda, you see me with a full face, and I am stunning. <laughs> so you can only imagine. Someone left me a comment that was like, you're so beautiful, you're almost post-human. <laughs> This is how my ego grows, is through love like that. I love y'all though. All right, bye! <laughs>